trust you found your place in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 this morning, and I continue the thoughts of uh, what I began last week, and that is the prophecy of end times. We're looking into the events that God has revealed to us concerning what is uh, going to happen in, um, the Bible says, yet to come, or the, the prophecies of, of those things that we have not seen yet, but we know the Bible teaches us will come. And I want to encourage you, as much as we believe Jesus came in the flesh and he lived and died a perfect life and a perfect death and gave his life for us, we believe that he's coming again. We believe that the things that he's told us are going to happen, will happen. Uh, and I'm thankful. I haven't given you uh, an overview of prophecy. Um, I, I think it's an absolute amazing miracle of God that things that will happen in the future and things that have happened were prophesied before time, sometimes up to thousands of years ahead of time, sometimes hundreds of years, and they were fulfilled to the very detail that they were prophesied to be. And I, I just, it's amazing to me, humanly speaking, that is impossible. The chances of that happening by random happenstance are absolutely, utterly impossible. Only God could do that. And I want to just tell you that because we have a not only do we have proof from the past, but we have a God in heaven who doesn't change, and His words are true, and uh, He doesn't lie. And He's revealed things through His word that we can understand and know. I want to caution you, we can't know everything. We can't see everything clearly. But we can know the things that God has revealed to us. And this morning, I want to be very clear about what those things are. Last week, we talked about the rapture, that is the receiving up of the church, those people that are saved to heaven. The Bible says that Jesus promised that when he left in Acts chapter 1, that he would come in like manner as they saw him go. We know that Jesus is coming to rapture the people uh, that, that know him, that trust him, is an absolute Bible doctrine. We looked at that last week, and I hope that that has been an encouragement to you. I want to go to what I believe is the second event on that prophetic calendar then, and that's what we find, uh, something I've preached about uh, back in the spring, and I hesitated to preach about it again because I thought, this is redundant, but I believe the Lord's laid it on my heart. I'm not going to preach the same message. It'll be a completely different thought, matter of fact, a different application of the truth this morning. So I hope that it's fresh to you. You have in your Bibles Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'd like you to look at verse 13 and 14 with me. The Bible is written here by, obviously, the Holy Spirit directing uh, the man Solomon, the king of Israel, to write. This is as he's later on in his life, towards the end of his life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And we find in verse number 13 these words of wisdom. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. If you have a theme verse, a motto for your life, man, chapter 12, verse 13 ought to be a part of that. This is the whole duty of man. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. There is, there is a summation of everything that we need to know right here in verse 13. But then notice really then the reason why that is important. Fearing God, the Bible says, and keeping His commandments is the duty of man for, in verse 14, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I want to use that this morning as a launching point into the truth, the doctrine of the, of the reality of the Bema seat, the judgment seat of God for every believer. And this morning I wanted to preach, if I can for a moment, not just on the doctrine of the reality of it, but how to practice that. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, would you open our hearts this morning to these words and our minds. Oh Lord, we need your discernment. We need your focus. Lord, so often we get involved in listening to something and we zone out or we get distracted because of burdens. Oh God, I pray that you'd help us this morning. And then would you teach us your truth? 
And then, Lord, as we understand truth, may we, may we grow to be convicted and convinced of this truth that it might change our lives. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. And we ask your help by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the fact of the matter is, the truth is that we will stand in judgment before God one day. Now, suffice it to remind us this morning that when we are saved and forgiven and redeemed by God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear me this morning, we will not be judged for our sins. Now, when I say we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I praise the Lord this morning that I can proclaim with all confidence that you and I will not give account for the things that we've sinned against God if we're saved this morning and redeemed. The Bible makes it clear that when we receive the gift of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that is eternal life, Romans 6, 23, that Jesus by His blood covers our sin and, and essentially covers them and washes them clean. Now I'm not saying this morning that when you get saved you're perfect, but by God's grace, He atones for our sin. The word atone means to absolve of guilt. Not only does He forgive us and recognize that what we did was wrong and, and provide us a way of forgiveness, but He absolves us of guilt. I preached about what atonement means several weeks ago. I love the fact that atonement means I don't have to go to bed at night guilty of my sin. Now, let me tell you today, a Christian who is living in sin, will feel, feel guilt because of that sin that you're walking in. And it's when you confess that before the Lord and make that right that you find once again that peace of mind. Now don't feel for a moment, Christian, that because I'm saved then I can sin or because I'm saved then I don't have to worry about sinning longer. No, the Bible says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if we're walking in this world redeemed, but I, I know that there's sin in my life, I have the privilege of going before a Heavenly Father and being purged from that sin. Uh, the Bible likened it to the Apostle Peter when Jesus was washing feet. Peter said, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter said, well, then wash my whole body. And, and the Lord said, no, Peter, you're misunderstanding. He that is clean doesn't need to be washed again but only his feet. And what he's saying is, once you're saved as a believer, you've been cleansed by the, glory of God, by, the, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his grace, and I praise the Lord for that. But how many of you know walking through this world, we do things wrong still? And I'm grateful that we have an opportunity then to find forgiveness and cleansing in the Lord Jesus Christ by confession of our sins. And so I don't want you to be confused by that. When we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, we will not give account for my sins. That was done on the cross of Calvary. That's what Jesus died for. My sins were laid upon Him. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that with His stripes we are healed. I want to just encourage you this morning, if you're not saved today, that doesn't mean you're, you're unsavable. Don't look at your life and say, there's no way that God could give me salvation. He couldn't forgive me. Let me tell you this morning, there is nothing that God cannot or will not forgive. I love the fact that we can say in First or Corinthians or Second Corinthians where the Bible says, uh, he goes through and talks about the fact that uh, some were adulterers and idolaters and fornicators and whoremongers and liars and all these things. And he says, of such were some of you. I mentioned that last week. The fact of the matter is, if you knew who you were sitting next to, you might not like them as much. I'm just kidding. But the fact of the matter is, we're all sinners saved by grace. God can take the vilest, wicked sinner, and He can save them. But you know what? Can I tell you this morning? God can also take the most clean hypocrite in the world and save him too. And I praise the Lord that God saves us by His grace. If you're not saved this morning, that's the first thing. Can I tell you this morning, as we stand before the Lord one day, after that rapture, I believe we're going to be with Him in heaven, there will be a time when we give account. The Bible says there in verse number 14, God shall bring every work into judgment. Now, He didn't say sin. He said work. Now, we find this borne out. I'm going to give you some, a lot of scripture today. This is a, what I'm going to say, 
<laughs> it's, it's a very topical message. I'm going to be in a lot of places in Scripture. I'm going to read them to you. If you want to take notes this morning, I would encourage you to set everything else aside and just start writing because there's going to be a lot of verses. I'm going to give you 12 points this morning, all right? Wow, Pastor, really? And we're going to get out of here at the same time as we always do. So you've got to be listening, all right? But here's what I want to encourage you in this morning. The great truth of Scripture is that we will be brought into account for our works the way we stewarded our life for His glory. Follow with me on a couple of verses if you would. Romans chapter 14, verse number 10. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one that of us shall give account of himself to God. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that you should be, I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing of by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring into light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Paul is saying, listen, I'm living my life in such a way that I'm not concerned about the praise or censure or judgment of mankind. I realize that I'm going to stand before God one day and give account for my life. That's the spirit of every Christian. Now, it's not that we don't care what other people think. It's that we care what God thinks more. And I'm not concerned about the judgment of someone else, whether they think I'm right or wrong. I'm not concerned about the judgment of the world, whether they think I'm right or wrong. I'm concerned about whether I'm doing right for the Lord. Because one day... I will stand and give account of myself before the Lord. And every one of us can say the same thing. Notice, if you would, then that there are places in Scripture, many other places in Scripture that we find this truth. But understand that the fact is, every believer will give account to God for his life. The matter is settled then. The doctrine is sure. There is no question about the fact that we will stand before God. Now the question then is, and this is what I want to answer this morning, how... Can I know that I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to measure up when I stand before the Lord? You, you might ask yourself this question, on what will I be judged? That's a good question, <laughs> isn't it? It's nice to know that we will know or we know what's on the test before we have to answer. Isn't that a blessing? Now, if I'm a good teacher, I'm going to give you the information and then I'm going to give you a test on it. How many of you know that's the way it normally works? I know there's some assessment tests to find out what you know. I get all that. I'm saying, though, in the life, I'm thankful that we'll know what's on the test. You say, well, I don't know what's on the test. Well, there's two things that could have happened there. Number one, you didn't learn what you should have learned. Or number two, you never, um, you don't remember what you learned, right? And, and in both of those cases, generally speaking, are not the fault of the teacher. I'm not saying teachers are perfect. Believe me, I've sat in classes before and said, I know I didn't learn this. And I still think I'm right. I can't prove it, but I will hold that to my grave. No, I'm just kidding. But generally speaking, it's the teacher's fault. Not really. <laughs> generally speaking, it's the, it's the student's fault, right? The fact is, we need to understand that when we don't know something, or if we don't remember something, it's not because we haven't been taught, it's because we haven't learned it. It's a big difference. So I want to encourage you this morning that when God says you're going to stand and give account before the Lord at the judgment seat, He's already told us what we're going to give an account for. You and I can know that. Now this morning, that's what I want to give you. These 12 points this morning are an, an example of what I believe we're going to stand and account for when we get to heaven. Are you ready for this? So I'm getting ready to give you the answers to the test. Now it's not me, it's from the Bible. So if you want to know what the, what the answers are, I encourage you to be writing down. Number one, I want you to notice this morning, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to give you uh, several verses of this. I'm going to go relatively quickly through here, Lord willing. Number one, I want you to see that I believe part of what will be judged on when we get to heaven is how we have treated others. How we treated others. Now, let me just give you the verse for that. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 10. The Bible says, For God 
is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Did you hear what the Bible says there? God is not unrighteous to forget your works. Can I tell you, I believe that when we stand before God, part of what we will be judged on is how we ministered to those around us, how we served those around us. Now, I know the world is today, um, you know, it's saying things like, you know, I don't want to be around people, or I don't, I'm not a people person, or I don't like people. Listen, I understand people will frustrate, people will bring problems, but can I remind you, you're a people too. So the bottom line is we don't love people because they're not like us. We don't love people because we don't love God. And when we love God, we will love people. And I believe a Christian will be judged before the judgment seat of Christ on how they've ministered and served others, according to Hebrews chapter 16, or 6 and verse 10. I also find in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 and 40, uh, excuse me, 41 and 42, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give a drink to one of these little ones, a cup of cold water only in the name of the disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. I'm saying today, that's not just talk. I believe God recognizes how we treat one another, how we treat those around us. And I understand the frustrations of this world, but can I tell you this morning, we will be held in account, I believe, for how we treat other people. Number two, I believe we'll be held in account on how we exercise our authority over others. You say, man, I'm glad I don't have that because I'm not an authority over others. Can I tell you this morning, there is a lot to be said about understanding our roles in this world and, and in God's plan. Husbands, we have a role in our homes you have a role in your workplace. You have a role in this world, the culture around us. Ladies, you have a role in your homes and in your children's lives and in the other lives that you influence. All of us have the opportunity to be an influence in other places. Listen, my friends, this morning, how you handle your authority that God has given to you will be judged one day. Can I tell you this morning, I believe that if you're not a good um, authority, maybe in your workplace, you have the opportunity to have some responsibility and authority. Listen, God tells us how we should be a good authority and employer in the workplace. God tells us how to be a good father in the home. God tells us how to be a good mother in the home. He tells us how to be a good pastor to his people. He tells us how to have authority according to the word of God. And I believe that we will give account to how we have stewarded that authority that God's given to us. Now, I believe there's several ways we could abdicate that authority. Sometimes we step away and say, I don't want to have authority in that way. When God's called us to that authority, shame on us. Step up. Step into that role of authority, not dictatorship. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about Bible, uh, the Bible model of authority, servant leadership, and do what God's called you to do. By the way, we all have authority with the gospel in this world. Did you know that? You all have the authority to go and take the gospel to the lost around you. You have that authority. You don't need the, the, the city council permission. You don't need the state's permission. You have the permission to take the gospel to every creature. Why? Because the Bible says all power, all authority is given unto me, Jesus said, in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, I don't need higher authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe part of what we'll give account for is the fact that I have authority in this world to preach the gospel to the world, and if I'm not doing so, I'm going to stand before the Lord and give account for that. We have authority. And so how we use that is very important. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Also, James chapter 3, verse 1, seems to indicate to me those in authority have a higher level of accountability. Notice it says there, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, that sounds very austere, but it just simply means this. 
when God calls us to a place of authority, we have a higher level of responsibility. Now, I'm thankful because if we had no authority, there would be chaos, right? Who would lead? Who would direct? That's a good thing. But also understand that that authority, with that privilege of authority, comes the responsibility of greater judgment. That's not bad. We just need to be aware of it. We will give account, I believe, how we exercise authority over others. Number three, moving quickly. We're almost a third done. Isn't that good? Number three, I, I want to just turn your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, Paul speaking to Timothy, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, so even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here's what I'm saying. Number three, I believe we're going to give an account to God for how we steward our God-given abilities. How we steward our God-given abilities. Now, we can couple with this the parable that Jesus gave of the ten talents. Do you remember that parable? How that when a man went away, he gave his, uh, his servants um, <clears throat> talents and he separated them according to their several abilities, he said. Some of them got five, some got three, some got one, and others. And uh, there's another parable of eight talents that the Bible talks about as well, but both of them are the same. The master went away for a time, told them to occupy, told them to do what they would with this. And then he came back. And he said, now I want you to give account for what you've done. And some of them said, well, I've doubled yours and I doubled this. And one guy said, I was really afraid, so I went and buried it in the ground. And here it is. I saved it for you nice and safe. Here it is. What did he say to them? He said, you're an unjust steward. Because I gave you something and you could have made something more with it. You could have used it and gotten, even just taken it to the bank and got interest on it. But you didn't do anything with it. You were afraid, and you buried it, and you didn't do anything with it. And here's what I'm saying. I believe that there is a truth to that that we can bring into today's world, and that is what God has given to you as an ability and as a talent and, and as a gift. It's our responsibility to use it for His glory because I believe one day we're going to give account for that. What are you burying that God wants to use? This is not pastor being mad. This is pastor saying, here's the answers to the test. Let's get busy. Mm -hmm. If you've got something that you're bearing, listen, we, we exist as a local church not to meet on Sunday morning. This is just one of our things we do. We exist as a local church body to minister the gospel to the world around us. And we do that by people like you and me who God has gifted that we can use for the ministry's sake. I'm thankful that we have people that have all kinds of giftings. Mm -hmm all kinds of abilities and talents. And I'm thankful for those who are faithfully using those. You say, Pastor, I can't play an instrument. That's fine. I can't, I can't do this. I can't. Stop looking at what you can't do and look at what you can do. What is it that God lays on your heart? You say, I really don't know what I can do. I don't know what my abilities are. Well, start serving somewhere. And God has a tendency to put everybody in their place, in line. And you'll find out real quick, I really fit in here. This is what I believe God's called me to do. This is what I believe God's gifted me to do. Get involved with something. I don't believe it's scriptural for a Christian to be saved and not be serving somewhere. I think it's anti-God's plan. God wants us to be serving. And I'm thankful we have the local church to do that in. Praise the Lord. Number four, if I can give you the fourth one. I believe we're going to be held into account on how we use our money. How we use our money. Say, Pastor, isn't this always about money? Listen, there's nothing more personal than money. I've already preached about this. We had a stewardship uh, month several uh, earlier this year. Here's the bottom line. Money is very personal. You know why? Because money represents our life. We give our life and we get at work or some other thing and we get money in return. It's a measure of our life. Now, I'm not talking about the financial situation of America or how we structure our financial currency. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the measure of currency that we use Oftentimes, we make it very personal because we've earned this. Now, let me say today, a spiritual, mature Christian understands that what we have is God's. And everything God gives us is by His grace. If you can earn money today, 
Yes, I'm sure you used your brain and your gifts and whatever you do and your abilities to earn that, but who gave you those things? I just remind you today that God is the owner of all things. And, and it just does us well when we can recognize that. Now, I believe we'll give account for how we use our money. Now, that's why the Bible tells us how it gives us principles on how to use it. I'm not going to go through all of them today. I can't. But let me give you a couple of thoughts, if I can, about this matter of our money. He tells us, and I, I, again, I preached about this, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 through 19. Listen carefully. Charge them that are rich in this world. Now, it doesn't say charge them that would be rich. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing sinful about riches. Listen to me this morning. Uh, so riches are not wrong. It's the pursuit and love of riches that are wrong. God chooses to bless and he can bless some, and God equips some to do others uh, to do great things, and that's a wonderful thing. I'll just give you a quick illustration. And by the way, let me preface this and say I'm not bitter at all, because it might sound like I am. I'm just kidding. My brother, uh, who's two years younger than me, God's given him an uncanny ability to make money. Now, he's in the ministry. He's been in the ministry his whole life, uh, like me. He's a system pastor down in Tennessee. But I'm telling you, that guy can take anything and turn it into money. I I'm serious. I don't know how he does it. Now, God's just given him a savvy to do that. Now, he's not filthy rich, but he's, he's done very well in using what God's given to him. Now, he's, he's faithful to the Lord. He's not pursuing money. It just seems like God can use that in a wonderful way, and he's a great giver. Mm -hmm. I praise the Lord for that. Now, what I'm saying is God equips some people to be able to do that. That's wonderful. So those that are rich, listen, here's the charge that God's told us, that they be not high-minded, Oh, look what I've done. All right, notice, nor trust in uncertain riches. It comes and it goes. Notice it says here, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, you say, well, it sounds like their salvation is contingent on their giving. No, but in just as much certainty as they have eternal life, this is the spirit by which they live their lives. Can I tell you, you say, well, I'm glad this doesn't apply to me, Pastor, because I am not rich. Can I understand if you look at someone else, you may say I'm not rich, but can I tell you today, if you look at the whole world, I repeat again, we're in the top 1% of the world. If you're an American today and you have a house and a car and you're going to go home and eat some food and you have running water and, and sanitation and you've got clothes and you're not concerned about the general survival of life day to day, you are wealthy. Don't, don't deceive yourselves. God has put within us a wonderful privilege and how we use that money, I believe one day we're going to give an account before God. You say, can't God just give me something I can have fun with? Listen. God's promise is, if you glorify me with this, I will pour you out the blessings of heaven. You won't be able to receive it, Malachi chapter 3 says. Now, I'm not one of those prosperity preachers. I'm just looking at God's word. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. I'm looking at the fact that if God tells us to give, we can by faith give, not just to the work of God, but praise the Lord, but to help others and all the things, then God says, I will bless that. And that's the kind of faith that God's looking for. So you'll give account one day. I'll give account for how we've used our money. There's hundreds of other principles probably. Maybe that's an exaggeration. There are scores of other principles that deal with money. How we use it, how we invest it, how we spend it, how we save it, what we do with it, how we borrow, how we don't. All these things God, God gives us in the Bible. We will give account, I believe, for that. Let's go on number five. We've got to hurry this morning. I believe we're going to give an account before God how much we suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. How much we suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't mean by that how much, if you stubbed your toe getting ready for church this morning. What I mean is, in the work of the ministry of the gospel, what have you suffered because of the gospel's sake? Church, can you just look at me for a minute here? I'm not one to look forward to suffering. I like peace. I like comfort. I love convenience just as much as anybody else. Can I tell you, there are dozens of ways that we can compromise in this world and quiet our testimony so that we don't suffer for the cause of Christ. And I'm talking about, yes, in our culture. We won't, we won't have to stand 
at the door like some will today and wonder if the police are going to pull in and arrest us all or send us all away because we're worshiping the Lord, threat with taking away our personal property, threat with arrest and prison time. Most of us won't deal with that in our lifetime. But may I tell you today, how much have you suffered for the gospel's sake this week? And that's not only the question, because you could say, well, I didn't really suffer. The question is, why haven't we suffered for the gospel's sake? Again, I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not going out looking for difficulty. But here's what I'm saying. If we're clear, Jesus suffered tremendously at times in his ministry because he spoke truth and he stood for truth. Many Christians in this world today are standing up. You're like, man, that person seems like they're always getting in trouble. People are always picking on him. Maybe because they're standing for truth. Now, again, we need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But, man, sometimes we tend to be more harmless as doves than wise as serpents. <laughs> the Bible says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, I'm the exception, Pastor. I'm living godly and I'm not suffering persecution. <laughs> I don't think so. Here's the question. I believe we're going to give account to God for how much we've suffered. Now, you say, is God just looking for people to suffer? No, He's looking for people to stand. The natural result of standing is suffering. It's not the emphasis. The emphasis isn't the suffering. The emphasis is the standing. The emphasis is the truth. It's the, it's the proclamation. Man, I love, I'm nothing, I'm, most of us are like me. We, we, we are very good at flying under the radar, right? I don't want to be detected. I, I don't want to be, no, I'll live for the Lord. I'll do, I'll serve, I'll do that. I just don't want to get up here where it's going to be detected. In my work, in my family, in my community, I'm not going to put up one of those scripture signs. That's kind of weird. You know, I'm not going to go talk to my neighbors or my coworkers. They might think I'm kooky. Listen, everything in appropriateness, everything in right, but are you willing to suffer for the Lord for the sake of the gospel? We will give account for that. Let me tell you the scripture on that, if I can. Look, if you would, listen, Matthew chapter 11, uh, chapter 5, verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. And then those last three words categorize it all. For my sake. For my sake. Blessed are the are the are ye. First Peter chapter four verse twelve. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Now that word fiery, don't be afraid. It's not about fire literally. It's about that that difficult trial that often comes, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Now listen that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And I tell you right now, none of us would want to, sur uh, uh, to, to have suffering. We wouldn't choose suffering and not just simply for the sake of suffering. Nobody would. And you'd be out of your mind if you would. But you would be a fool if you didn't look at the price and the blessing of suffering in the world to come. Because if you understand the joy that is set before us, the Bible says the, the persecution of this world is nothing. When we stand before the Lord, when God's glory is revealed, none of us are going to stand and say, man, I'm glad I didn't stand more for the Lord. All of us are going to say, man, if I only knew what this was about, the things of the world and my dynamics at work and my fear of my family and neighbors and other things, it's nothing compared to what we have right now. That's the spirit of it. Standing for truth and right in this world seems overwhelming. And yes, the strong, the, the will of, of the culture is strong. But may we understand today, according to 1 Peter, we are going to stand before God one day. And when we do, we can have joy that is exceeding. If we understand the fact that we're going to give account before the Lord for how we suffered for the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Oh, brothers, this morning and sisters, can you not see with me that in eternity, the time of judgment will be that the value of our standing is so much greater than the persecution that we suffered. So much greater. 
I can't even, I can't even eloquently get it across. I'm praying the Holy Spirit would drive that into our hearts with conviction. How are you standing for the Lord in this world? Brother and sisters, listen to me. Every one of us, it doesn't matter where we are, if you're in college or in, in a home or in work or, or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. We all will have an opportunity to stand before the, stand before the world and we can be a, a testimony to the world around us for who Christ is and what He's done. We'll give account for that one day. Let me give you number six, how we spend our time. I'm going to go quickly through this. I believe we're going to give account how we spend our time. Ephesians 5, 16, see then that she walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I could go back to chapter 5 and verse number 15, and you'll see that the context is the, the time of judgment, the time of God's coming, the fact that our time is short. Why? Redeem the time because the days are evil. Redeem the time. How we use your time is something that we will stand and give account before for the Lord. Can I tell you today, you will give account for the moments that you sat in church this morning. How you've, how you've listened and how you've, how you've attained the Word of God. I believe that's true. You'll give account for how you spend your afternoon and how you spend your evening and how you spend tomorrow. And listen, you say, what am I supposed to be doing, Pastor? There's all kinds of principles. We all have to eat and sleep. I understand we've got to work. That's true. But, but you better be careful about those things that, that you can't be uh, or that you can't have control over. Even at work, I'm amazed. The amount of energy that goes into robbing an employer of time. I'm serious. I, I've been back. In, I'm, I've worked in the secular workforce, you know, most of my life. And I'm back into it now a little bit as most of you know, and not just in my workplace, but in, in, in places that I, it's amazing to me how people pride themselves in how little they can do and how much money they can get paid for doing so little. It prides, it's amazing to me. Christians, it ought not to be. It ought not to be. You say, well, my coworkers are going to hate me. <laughs> do right. Do right. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be stuck up. You don't have to be obnoxious. Do it right. Do it with the right spirit. Humble yourself. God gives grace to the humble. How we spend our time at home. How we spend our time in entertainment. How we spend our time in any area. God wants us to understand that we will have an account before God for that time. Colossians 4 verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. The Bible says in 1 Peter um, 1 verse number 17. If we call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, in respect to what God says. Psalm 90, verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Number seven, I believe we're going to give an account for how we run the race God has chosen for us. I believe we're going to give an account for how we run the race that God has chosen for us. Look, if you would, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Obtain what? The prize. What is the prize? The reward at that judgment seat, whatever that is. So run. Fulfill the, the journey that God's put you on. You say, I don't know what that journey is. Well, we know the will of God. I preached that last Wednesday night. You know how to find the will of God daily. Go back and listen to the message. God's revealed His will to us. Be in God's will today, and He will lead us Every moment, we'll find ourselves where we need to be. I praise the Lord for that. So we run the race that God's given to you. Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward, forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says later on, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Praise the Lord. The prize of fulfilling the course that God's called you. I don't like this course. It's not your course. It's God's course. Let him fulfill the work that he's done. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain, Paul says. Philippians 2 verse 16. Number eight, I believe we're going to give an account for how effectively we subdue our flesh on this world. 
You say, how does that work? Well, the Bible tells us that we need to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You say, I thought that's what Jesus does. He's given us the power to do it. You have to have the will to do it. Can I say that again? God's given you the power to have victory over your flesh. The deeds of the flesh are, are doctrinally mortified. I don't have to serve my flesh like I did before I was saved. But I have to have the will to do it. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Reckon yourself to be dead into the flesh, Romans tells us. That means consider yourself to understand your flesh doesn't have dominion over you. So I believe we're going to give an account for that. Listen to what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 9.25. 1 Corinthians 9.25 down through verse 27. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now that may be flowery words, but it just means if you want to be good at something, you're going to keep other things out of your life so that you can be good at that one thing. People who are good at sports... Can I tell you? That's all they've done. You can't be good at sports and good at everything else. Mm -hmm. You can't be good at gymnastics and be every, uh, good at everything else. You can't be a good whatever it is and be good at everything else. You know the, the phrase, jack of all trades and master of <laughs> none, right? You might be able to do a lot, but you're not good at all of them. Somebody who's good at it makes a priority. This is what I'm doing. And they ex exclude other things. So he that is striving for the mastery must be temperate in all things. The Bible says there, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. People that do that do it so they can win the gold medal, or they can win the title, or they can win the Super Bowl ring, or they can win the World Series ring, or whatever it is. They're doing it for something that is corruptible. Can I tell you, that gold ring, or that ring, or that medal is good, but it hangs on the fireplace, and eventually it's just a piece of decoration. Can I tell you today, that corruptible crown, if someone's willing to set aside everything in their life so they can attain that one thing, and they get it, and that's it, good for you. <laughs> but we do it, the Bible says, to obtain an incorruptible crown. Not only does it not pass away, but it never loses its luster. It doesn't lose its attractiveness. And I mean by that not just visually, but in our hearts. It's always something that's valuable. I, I can't even comprehend getting something that never loses its value uh, sentimentally or materially. That's what the Bible's talking about, incorruptible. But I keep under my body, he says, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Here's what Paul's saying. Listen, I'm so concerned. I want the mastery of the ministry so much that I have to keep my own body under subjection lest when I preach to others that they ought to do the same thing, my testimony and my life becomes a shipwreck because of, of my lack of care for myself. You don't tell you how many pastors have fallen because they're, they're concerned about the work of the ministry and they're not concerned about their own spiritual lives and they allow little compromises to come in and little things to happen and all of a sudden their message loses every bit of power because they are the castaway. Can I tell you it's not just pastors though? Christians are the same way. Do you have a testimony that stands for the Lord? Listen, it's hard to stand and proclaim the truths of God's word about the flesh while you're failing in the flesh as well. May God help us that we would have victory over the flesh and over the things of this world. You say, man, you sound a little bit angry, Pastor. No, I'm saying this is the answers to the test that we're going to face in heaven one day standing at the beam of seat of Christ. How you give, how you spend your time, how you steward your money, how you subdue the flesh. Let me give you number nine. We're moving fine here through this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I believe we're going to give an account for how we witness for the Lord Jesus and bring others to Christ. Can I just ask you very simply, church, as a believer, I'm not questioning anybody's salvation. That's not for me to judge. I believe we have many sincere folks here this morning that truly have trusted Christ and have been saved. Can I tell you today, when is the last time you've yourself brought someone to the Lord Jesus? When's the last time you've been a part of helping someone come to the Lord Jesus? Paul says some water, some plant, God gives the increase. So you might, you might not be the actual one that sees them trust Christ, but have you been a part of someone coming to the Lord? Have you given out a gospel tract this week? I was thankful, talking to Brother Joel, I don't want to steal his, his testimony, but he said, Pastor, I had a great day with the Holy Spirit on Friday. I went out, Gave testimony, handed out tracts. Some of them were well-received. It just was, just was so encouraging. I know exactly how he feels. When's the last time you've helped bring someone to the Lord? I didn't know that was my responsibility. Absolutely. Every single one of us. 
preach the gospel to every creature. I'm not here to condemn you this morning. I'm here to challenge you to think, if you haven't been involved in bringing someone to the Lord, we're not fulfilling what I believe God wants us to do. And I'm encouraging you. We've got a new chance this week. You've got new mercies tomorrow. Don't walk by the track rack like you've done the last six months. Pick tracks up with you. Or dig into your glove box where you've got a stack this big you forgot about. Or in your purse or wherever it is. And give them out. Talk to somebody. Invite them. You know, listen, the average unsaved person has zero desire to go to church. And I get it. Unless they have some habit or feel some guilt, church doesn't have any appeal to them whatsoever. I mean, you've got a free day on Sunday morning. You've got football games going on. You've got family things. You've got yard work to do. You've got all kinds of things you want to do. Why come to church? And I get it. So, so the fact of the matter is that God has to do the work. But listen, if you can preach the gospel to that person and they trust Christ, all of a sudden church takes on a whole new meaning. Did you know that? I'm just saying, let's, let's bring someone to the Lord. I think we will give account for that when we get before heaven, or get before the Lord in heaven. Listen to the Bible here. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian or the Thessalonians. What is our hope? What's our joy? What is our reward, our crown of rejoicing? He says, here's the answer. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. You know, I don't think it's just a sappy song when we sing. When we get to heaven and we see the people that we've had an opportunity to bring to Christ, that's going to be the joy. That's going to be the rejoicing. I had a part in them coming to church. I brought them in on the bus. I taught them in the Bible club. I remember giving them a track on the road. I remember... You know, we had this interaction. The Lord laid on my heart to talk to them. Maybe they didn't get saved right then, but because of what I've done, I planted the seed or I, I watered the seed, and they, they're in heaven today. I prayed for them to be saved. It was, it was a testimony that I get, whatever. It's not pride, but it's saying, I had a part in that person being in heaven today. Paul says that is our crown of rejoicing. Some people call that the soul winner's crown. When you get to heaven, are you going to have any... Of those crowns? Listen, I didn't write the Bible. I'm just saying, this is the test. This is the answers to the test. Here's what you need to do, church. Here's what we need to have as our focus before the Lord. Number 10, how we react to temptation. I'm going to very quickly go through this. I'm not going to spend time. James chapter 1, verse number 2. How we react to temptation. When I mean temptation, I mean the trials and the testings of life. This is a whole message of itself, but I, I can't. I can't help but just say this. Church, many times as we get into a trial or temptation, our first response is, how do I get out of this? When in reality, what we should be asking is, Lord, what do you want to teach me? How can you grow me through this? Endure the temptation. You, you find yourself in James chapter 1 and uh, verse number 2. Notice what the Bible says there. As I turn over myself, look at the Bible here, <coughs> verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy... When you fall into divers or different temptations, the word temptations there doesn't mean a temptation to sin. It's a trial. So count it all joy when you fall into different or many temptations, knowing this, that the trial or trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect or complete and entire, lacking or wanting nothing. So many of us are so interested in throwing off these trials that we're in, physically or financially or relationally. And I understand that. There is no, the Bible says, no trial seemeth to be joyous in the moment. Nobody wants, us, nobody wants to go through that. Can I tell you, God gives or allows trials for a very specific reason in your life. And if you will just rejoice in that trial and not seek to... Let it identify you or, or um, shipwreck your faith or be an obstacle to your faith. Rather, it can be such a huge building block. Some of the sweetest, most faithful servants of the Lord are those who've gone through the deepest, fiery trial. And at the end of that trial or during that trial, their spirit is always in rejoicing to the Lord. And they're just reflecting that to the Lord, minimizing the trial, emphasizing the Lord. Can I tell you, there's just a sweet, effective 
ministry and testimony there. I can't even describe, describe and I think in heaven it'll be multiplied a thousand times and more. Number 11, second to last one. How we live in light of the rapture. We'll give account for how we live in light of the rapture. I talked about the rapture last week, but listen to this, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Here's what we're saying. I love the Lord's appearing. Okay, if that means anything, it means that I'm expecting it and living in light of that expectation. In other words, my life is orientated around the fact that Jesus could come any day. I'm not going to re-preach last week's message, but listen, there is something about that. We will receive a crown, a, a reward, I believe, at the judgment seat based on how we live our life in light of Jesus' coming. Are you going to be taken by surprise? Are you going to be taken off, uh, off guard? Are you going to be ready, expecting, waiting, like those, like those ten virgins, remember? Five of them had enough oil. The other five had to go into the marketplace and buy oil. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came and they all went in and the door was closed. And then the five came back and they couldn't go in because they didn't have, they weren't there ready. I, I believe the illustration is that oil is the, the symbol of I'm ready and prepared for the coming of the Lord, both in salvation and in my work. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Number 12, how faithful we are to the word of God. I believe we'll be judged by how faithful we are to the Word of God. I'm not saying how much you read the Word of God. I'm not even saying how much you believe it. I'm saying how much you let that guide your life. I believe the verses I'm going to give you, first of all, primarily pertain to pastors. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, Feed the flock of God over which, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. I believe here the idea is, listen, the role of the pastor is to feed the flock, that is, the people of God, the Word of God faithfully, not being a Lord that is a dictator, not being someone who pushes around their weight and authority, but rather being an ensample, that is, by example and by proclamation, preaching and teaching the Word of God. And that's a heavy responsibility. Because the pastor stands up and here and says, Thus saith the Lord, and everybody's looking at his life. And that's okay. But the pastor better be a good example. And I'm preaching to myself but how faithful we are to the Word of God. It's not up to me to get up here and preach what I feel or what I think or what the latest thing in culture is. Now, I think the Bible bears to culture. There's no doubt about it. But how faithful am I to the Word of God? And by extension, how faithful are you to the Word of God? So, number one, I think that deals with pastors and, and, and so forth. The Bible says in First Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he's charging Timothy, a man, young man, that was entering into the ministry I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant and in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here's what he's saying Timothy, I'm challenging you because there's coming a day when Jesus is coming. You need to stay faithful to the word of God. And that was the role of the responsibility of the preacher, the pastor, the Timothy there in that passage. Listen, I, I, I would hate. There would never be a day when nobody would come to hear the Word of God. But if there's someone here to hear the Word of God, I'm going to preach the Word of God, whether it be one or a thousand. I praise the Lord. I, I pray that God would help me to have that spirit. But listen this morning. It's not just about the pastor. It's about the people. It's about those that are willing to follow and be faithful to God's Word. Acts chapter 20, verse 26 through 28, and I'll be done. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. How important is it that we give attention to God's word. Be faithful to it. Church, I'm done. You've done well today. But this is not the test. This is just the lecture. This is the lesson. 
you know these things, but hopefully putting them into a list will help you to see one day, there's coming a day, as we established at the beginning of the message, Jesus is coming again, and he's going to take us to heaven, and at that moment, I believe we will stand before the judgment seat of God, what the Bible says is the Bema seat. Now, you say, man, I don't want all that sin that I've done to come out. Listen, if you're saved today, that is completely covered, amen. But it's not like I can just be like, oh, I got my ticket to heaven, I'm going to live my life how I want to. It's I got my ticket to heaven, now I have a responsibility, not because God's like twisting my arm, but out of love for what he's done for me, to serve him and to follow what his plan is for my life. Aren't you thankful he gives us the answers? Church, how serious are you going to be about these things? I trust that God would help us. We're going to stand before the Lord one day and give account of ourselves to